Charles Corral on the road series said that if we stop thinking of America as highways and start thinking of it as rivers, we get a little closer to the country. I'm sure that the Native Americans felt a very spiritual part of their lives was the flowing waters. Water is so important to life. Without it, we die. It is a life-giving stream and that, I think, is so very elemental to the human spirit. And I think we are lucky to be a part of the Ohio as a people and as a city. We lived on that river when we were kids, and we were down there every day. Uh, we'd be down there all day, and we'd come home and get cleaned up and have dinner with our family, and next thing you know, we're all back down the river again. <laughs> when you take the first swallow, of the Ohio River because we all swam in it and you, you had to swallow it sometimes and as soon as you would swallow the first swallow you became a river rat so we were all river rats <laughs> and proud of it <laughs> And when I walk along the river with the trees and the birds and the water flowing all in one, I always find God in the beauty and the power and the strength of the things he created. And we see it from the very early hymns. Let us gather at the river. And we certainly have gathered as a town at the river. We are gathered at the river. And my brother and I would go down and sit on a little church down at the 26th Street Playground, and we loved to watch the people baptizing the black people down on 24th Street. They'd take tambourines like this and jump up, and one guy even played a saw. Boy, we thought it was great. They danced around the streets and everything when they had. And an old Reverend Lester who was the preacher down there. And all of us kids would sit there and watch them baptize the black people. At back time, they had the white robes on, and they They'd dunk them down in the water like that there and lift them out. And, oh, we thought it was great, you know. They baptized them down there in the river. Sometimes we went with John boats. We had big John boats. Somebody would own and, and uh, 
one time I remember somebody took a Victrola. We had music while we paddled our canoes. two sons in California and they went there you know for work now the one married a girl from there but they want to move back home and we tell them there's nothing back here there's no work you know you're going to have a hard time because he's got a good job out there and everything and he said I'd rather be poor in West Virginia than have money in California he said I want back home I miss my hills I miss my river People do love water. No matter where you go, you see people around the water. Even nothing more than just to sit on a bank or floating on planks, no matter what. I mean, they're there. People don't play that. Play the river for what it's what it is. It can, it can do more damage and kill you more ways than any other act of nature, I think. Who knows a river's temper? Who can be fearless when it rampages? The waters of the old Ohio are part of Wheeling's history. It will always be, even when we are not. Ohio is a derivation of an Indian word, meaning river of foaming waters or river of raging waters. And some days when there's a good wind whipping up and a good storm on the horizon and you see the white caps on the river, as I did last week, you remember that. The Ohio has such a personality. Yesterday it was like a clear lake mirroring the autumn trees. Today it might very well be raging with white caps. It has a different face on any given day. And of course, then you look down the valley and you see the hills and you realize that over all these thousands of years, this water has carved the land to its own image, in a sense. And when Wheeling was founded, this was the edge of the frontier. So across the river was the Ohio country, and the main tribe in this region was the Shawnee. They had their main villages around Chillicothe, then the Wyandots, the Delaware, and of course the Mingo right on the Ohio. It's hard on the beach, or she moves too slow. Way down the Shawnee town on the Ohio. Now the current's got her and we'll take up the slack. We'll float her down to Shawnee Town and we'll bushwhack her back. And it's hard on the beach, or she moves too slow. Way down to Shawnee Town on the Ohio. Wheeling was special because of the river. That's why Wheeling became a city in the first place. And in 1800, 
there were only eight major cities along the Ohio, and we were one of them. Our development was directly connected to the Ohio River, the main highway of America for so many years. Why use your feet when you can sit on a boat and let the current take you? And obviously it was a simple, direct, and cheap way of travel. And as the United States grew westward in the early part of the 19th century, Wheeling was well placed. It was on the river. All the towns and cities that grow in the 19th century, the Chicago's, the Cleveland's, the Cincinnati's, the St. Louis's, and so on, all grow along some waterway. The river was what helped the cities along here become the industrial area that we were because you could get your you know, goods in and out of the, the valley. Well, the thing was Burger Bear River. We've had molasses, sugar, flour, salt in barge loads going up the river. Of course, you got down to coal and your gas and oil products and your steel products is the main thing this day and age. But, oh, yes, they've, they've even ferried a big barge load of horses. They've shipped everything. Barge load of nails, of course, kegs. You name it, has been on the river. I can remember different boats pulling in and everything. My father, he'd bring us down 12th Street here and then unload the cattle here. And he'd walk them up 12th Street and take them out in East Wheeling to the slaughterhouse, which was Goose Town, see. This was as far as you could get west of the Allegheny Mountains. And eventually a lot of people got on the boats here and headed down the river to St. Louis and then went on out through Texas, and which I think is where my great-great-uncle went when he got out into the New Mexico areas, I think he came from this area, headed down to St. Louis and headed west because he heard about oil and all that other stuff. And I'm sure like all the gold rushers and the oil dreamers, he wound up out there somewhere. In the spring of 41, he came up from New Orleans. Off of Mississippi to old St. Joe on a steaming river queen. The Missouri on a flatboat by just a scamp at 17 with a wild look in his eye because he heard all the tales of wild spaces to the west so cap him up and shot him far and wide and he knew he had to go cause he could never rest the Ohio River in the Civil War was important because of transportation of troops. The steamboats would come and pick up troops and take them to battles. That worked in conjunction with the B&O. Also, some boats would bring the wounded to Wheeling Hospital. It was also a boundary between a southern state, we were part of Virginia until 63, and a northern state, Ohio, a free state, a slave state. And so it was kind of a boundary for tension in those days. The river was a vehicle for the Underground Railroad. Once you got across, you were in a free state. Follow the drinking ghost for the old man Waiting for to carry you to Canaan, you follow the drinking gold. Of course, under the Fugitive Slave Act, that didn't count for much, but one side of the river you were a slave, the other side you were free. Must have been a tremendous burden unleashed once you got away from the pursuers, if there were any. So in Wheeling's history, we have that untold story of these courageous people helping the black person across the river to a new life. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is waiting for to carry you to Canaan. You follow the drinking gourd. 
The Ohio River made the difference. Schools in Ohio along the Ohio River border were integrated. The schools over here did not become integrated until after Brown versus Board of Education. Bigfoot traveling on, you follow the drinking gold. Follow. Well, the wharf parking garage, they used to tie their boats up there at the mooring post years ago. It used to be called Nippo Park. Right now, if you go up along the uh, river on that bike path, that walking path, they've got a kind of a monument set up for the different wars. We glorify war in this country. Right next to that is a building with bars on the windows. That was a baggage and a ticket place for the Pennsylvania Railroad. In fact, the first real streamliner came into Wheeling on that track. It was a huge black engine, steam-driven, but the cowlings were all shiny black with gold edging. It was quite a thing. I first went to New York in 32. I remember going down to get on the railroad train. There was a car every night. There was one sleeping car that went from Wheeling to New York City and came back the next night. It was the same Pullman Porter that was on it all the time. Then my dad played in the municipal band that played at the wharf every Saturday night. The wharf at that time, there was a park called Riverside Park down there where Lou's Landing is now. That, that's where the old, the concerts at the wharf used to be down there. I can remember going down there, the trains were still running, and they'd come up in the middle of the concert, you know. They'd have to stop and let them go past and things like that. Right near the railroad tracks was a park that ran down to the river. It was called Hobo Park, but it wasn't really. It was a very pretty park, and it was all cobblestones with a brick path that ran down the middle of it that where the boats came in, because there was a lot of steamboat traffic in those days. In uh, 1936, they had a race of those steamboats on the river. There was a Dixie the Stormy, the Virginia, the Costanza, the Meriwether, the Paragon, and they were all racing up and down the river on those boats in those big stern wheelers. It was quite a sight, and they had fireworks, of course, on the barges. take you down the river. I could tell you the name of every packet. That was the ones that hauled freight. Like the, the Senator Cordell had hauled freight like between Pittsburgh and Wheeling, see. Then there was another one called the General Wood. That was another big freight boat. That ran on down the river, but way down. Then there was one run between Wheeling and New Matamoros. That was called the Helen E. And that was a packet boat. Uh, but that made a trip every day, you could, uh, hell and me, down and back, see. Then your big entertainment boats would come in, like with dance floors on them. Oh, yeah. There was be the big ones that was most popular at the time was the Homer Smith. That was a big boat. It used the orchestra and people go in there and dance. That was, a, that was an entertainment boat. Then there was another little side wheel called the Bernie Swain. 
that had wheels on both sides, you know, the peasant instead of in the back. Then there was another one came in one time, oh, I'll never forget. I got a job on it. Boy got sick, you know. This happened to be he was a drummer. Needed somebody real quick. That was called the East St. Louis. It was a monster. Oh, it was it was mostly on the Mississippi. It was a big boat. Big steamboats, you know. And up on the top, we used to call them calliopes in them days. Calliopes, you know. For steam, and they'd play them, you know. You could hear them from miles away when they'd be coming up the river. You could hear them clapping. Oh, there comes the so and so, you know. We knew she was coming, see, like the East St. Louis and the the Homer Smith. But we also had showboats on the river, uh, sit down on the wharf, like Old Land River and all that stuff they put on. Saturday afternoon, the showboats would come, and they would put on a performance. The Calliope would play to announce that they were in town, because there was no set time. It was whatever they got up the river, and uh, they would play the Calliope, and you could hear it all over town, and you knew it was time. You could get dressed and go down and see the performance. It was fascinating to see all the women with makeup on and up that close, or you could see the mascara and all these sinful things. You see, in our days, the only entertainment we had was your old showboats that traveled from Cincinnati to Pittsburgh, there's about five or six of them, that they put on live plays. Well, the old Water Queen and Majestic, and they'd spend a night each little village, go to Pittsburgh, and then they'd change when they come down and have another play coming back down. That's the only entertainment we had. Yeah, we went to show boats. They were fun. We had a wonderful time. And you eat candy, taffy, and, and uh, just very festive, you know. But real riverboats, they can have dancing up on the stage, and, and women in their flamboyant dresses, and men with their funny stories. And it was uh, a lot of fun. Today, the steamboat is no more. 
Oh, there's excursion boats on the on the river, but they're not the true steamboat. They don't run by coal anymore. They usually run by diesel. And the true steamboats have been relegated to either floating museums, uh, showboats, or uh, restaurants. We have a lot of boats that try to mimic steamboats, but the true steamboat has slipped away. It has gone. The boats do it all now. It used to be the... Then the men did it all. The old saying is, them days they had wooden barges and armed men. Now they got armed barges and wooden men. But it's, uh, it's all a fact of history. It comes and goes in a cycle. The flatboats were tremendous. With the current, it was harder coming upriver. Grandfather Prince would take a load of whatever he was taking all the way down to New Orleans and would have to come back either by a horse or walk back, and he did that. It was harder coming upriver, and of course that's where the steam engine comes in. How important that must have been to really open the river up to true navigational trade. <laughs> During the era of the steamboat, which started back in the early 1800s and ran up through the mid-1930s, 75% of the boats that traveled the inland waters of America were built along the shores of the Ohio. They were built here in Wheeling. With the coming of the steamboat on the river, the river became an extension of the National Road, and it helped in the westward expansion. Now, by the 1840s, there were nearly 2 million people traveling by steamboat on the rivers. And flush times had come to this area. Many men made their fortunes, and the steamboat was the wander of the frontier west. Wheeling at one time built an awful lot of boats. Listen, they rivaled Pittsburgh. Of course, Pittsburgh kept on going. And I never could understand why Wheeling quit building boats. The Phillips Shipyard was very important here. We built some very fine boats for Ohio River traffic. The Washington, one of the finest and the first of the big steamboats on the Ohio, quite a reputation, built and outfitted right here in Wheeling. And, and the river was a dangerous place. It took many men's lives. My mother was a cook on the river. My stepfather was an engineer on the river. My grandmother was a cook. I had ants that worked on the river going back 100 years. And uh, I just followed in the footsteps. The river, cheap transportation. I loved it. Of course, but 40 years now. 40. My father and grandfather had a ferry boat at the Faye Lease Age, which was 12 mile above Huntington. And we had a gas boat, two barges. We towed apples and things like that from there to Cincinnati and Galpolis and places like that. But we had the ferry boat up until 1927. I used to go swimming down the river when I was a kid, and the old stern wheelers used to come up in the channel next to the banks, you know. And the guys would holler at me. And, uh, Every time I seen them buggers go up and down the river, I said, now that's what I'm going to do when I get the chance. That big stern wheeler coming up the creek Make my start to water and my knees get weak That old deep whistle when it starts to blow Says, come on, it's time to go I want to be planted when I die And where I can see steamboats are paddling by Cause all I ever wanted since ten years old Was to pick and to ride an old boat I see that pilot at the wheel Saving souls on a 12-inch keel I hope someday that you'll be me on the MISIP But you see floods, drowning, there's always something. Get in trouble with the boat, you won't have enough power. See a freeze river one year, for 21 days we laid 
in the ice. We couldn't move. Every time we strung with her and every time he stirred up, you'd take your wheel right off. A job like that is hard on family life because the amount of time you spend away from home and stuff like that. And it's, it's not the easiest job in the world. And the only reason they don't teach it in college is because they don't have any professors in there who know anything about it. The money's good. Stress, these people don't know what stress is, man, out here in this world. You think just because the car breaks down, they got a lot of stress, they ought to try getting on one of them when the engines go out. <laughs> Steering goes out, high water. It happens all the time. You know, because a lot of them toes there, you got $20 million you're sitting on, and they don't want that wrapped around a bridge bear. The company's pretty particular. My dad and those never known to shut down the ferry boat in windways. All the rest of the ferry boats did. Dad wouldn't. That's the way I was raised. Well, the rougher it got on the river, the better I liked it. Every time we went out, it was a rough time. <laughs> we, back in, uh, it must have been around 55, 56, Pennsylvania had a big mill up there. And sulfur. The sulfur was terrible. You would go, you can go through that sulfur. You had to put men out on the head of the barges because you couldn't see for about two miles. And we went up in there one day and where the air would positively not move, like a Death Valley deal. We got up in it and couldn't get out. Couldn't see the lights on the boat. You couldn't see nothing. About three days after that, our pilot died. And I think there's 127 people in that town died from that thing. It was the Norris Steel War Mill. But you go through there in the daytime, you'd have somebody have to go out on the head, so, you know, just, you couldn't see from back on the boat. Which, in them days, you'd you have three standard barges or 175 foot apiece, so you're 425 foot back from the head. That's the days before radar. The older pilots, they had no radar. And the only way they knew another boat was out there, they, they blew the whistle ever so often. Know somebody else out there in the fog. But them fellas knew the river. Why they wasn't on the bank all the time, I don't know, but, but they could run in fog. Of course, now you've got radar that helps all your boats now. But the old pilots, all they had was your river lights, your government river lights, and very few of them, and their knowledge of the river. They knew every sandbar, I think they knew every rock in the bottom of the river. There's a light at the river, a light at the river, there's a light at the river I can see. My Lord will stand there holding his hand, a light at the river for me. That's the days before radar. You used to go out there and get in the fog and that and be running. Stand out there throwing stones. As long as you hear them splash, you're all right. When you hear them hit ground, you'd haul her back and tell them we got a problem. Uh, we're getting too close to right bank or too close to left bank. Then the pilot, he'd use magnaphones like cheerleaders use. You didn't have no walkie talkies or intercons or anything in them. No radar. It's just uh, good old days. And the cursed fog gets so thick You cannot see the bank And it's hard on the beach Or she moves too slow Way down to Shawnee Town On the Ohio They took all the fun out of river boating. Now you got cellular phones, radios, fax machines, <laughs> Well, the old days, all you had was an AM radio, you know, and I tell you, I'm sorry, I can't hear you breaking up on me, you know. <laughs> Go do what you want.
Get in touch with God. Oh, I had my own boat, Virginia. The one I had was built in 1923. And I worked there right up until about 58. And I think that was the last operating sternwater around this area. The sternwaters we're talking about probably uh, quit operating in the early 40s. Because these diesel boats didn't start making their move until mostly right after World War II. So diesel really improved it. I mean, picked up a lot of speed. You took a lot of horsepower and compacted it into small units, you know. It's not as powerful as the old steam was. Because if I remember right, that old Sprague, why, that thing could push 100 barges. Diesel was in operation when I started on there. You had to do it in order to compete. And uh, now the boats are fast. And as they went ahead and uh, developed, naturally, they got bigger and more powerful. And I think the last biggest one they made was either ten or 12,000 horsepower. You know, back in my days, we had the packet boats. All your farmers had apple barrels that time, which was held three bushel apples. And they would bring all their apples to the riverbank. And your packet boats, when they saw apples laying there, they'd come in, pick them up, take them to Cincinnati to storage. Oh, they would, if two of them saw them at the same time, listen, they would run together trying to get there first. And at night time, some of your old farmers up on the river, they hung up a lantern. The packet boats knew to come in and pick up what they had. And it's really a fascinating business, you know, when you really get down to it. How you can move all that weight. Yeah, just a few hundred horses. <laughs> it, you tow everything out there. Coal, sand, gravel, you tow chemicals, you tow uh, petroleum, you name it, they tow it. Because it's the cheapest way to travel. So much per ton per mile is the way you figure your cost, you know. And the last time I had to figure cost, good Lord, it was only about two cents per ton per mile to move all that. So that's cheap. All the bottom of your packet boats were for livestock. Your next floor, of course, was your passengers. Then you had your deckhands, and they were treated like animals, really. I have seen the old mate stand out on the end of the boat with a black snake whip, and if they didn't move fast enough, he could just peel the hide off of them. He was good at that whip. Been on a river for, oh, I guess maybe 34 years. He started out deckhand, and retired as a captain. My dad, he worked at Wirt and Steel. The only time I snuck in to see him one time, Aaron, they caught me and he brought me home and tanned my hide with a razor strap and never been back in the mill since. What a mess, man. Hot. Steel. Sweat. It was, wasn't my kind of work. I think that's what impressed me. Stay out of the mills. I worked maybe a, a year in a steel mill and a year maybe on a railroad. But that I always went back to the river right away. I just liked the river. I don't know. It was just a good, clean life. The money was pretty decent. So I made like Mark Twain, you know, where I can get out there and cuss and steer and cut down the human race. And <laughs> hey, now I know where he got his philosophy. He was my idol anyhow, Mark Twain was. <laughs> There's not too many driving you. My son, when he got out of high school, there was no college in his books. And he went on the river, and he's 42 years old now, and he's, he's never been off of it yet. 
network leads to longevity in a way too, because you're on there usually. If you're working a six or six, they've got pretty reliable equipment. You sleep approximately ten hours a day. You eat three well cooked meals every day, and uh, you get exercise. There's no bars to stop in, no beer joints. The air is usually pretty good out there. Where does an old time river man go after he's passed away? Does his soul still keep a watch on the deep for the rest of the river days? Does he then come back as a channel cat? Are the wasps in light on the wheel? Are the birds that fly through a summer sky? Are the fish swimming under the keel? Where's an old time pilot go after he stood his last watch? River boats. Was the last bastion of freedom in this country. Smoke, cuss, chew tobacco, do anything you want to, as long as you do your job. No wonder Mark Twain was so successful. I mean, he just took all those characters that he ever knew and just made them into a story. And it's just something that everyday people don't run into. You know, and the language and the things that happen. Really fascinating. I mean, you work in a steel mill or something like that. Now, what kind of a story can you write about a steel mill, really? You know? My mother's father retired as a river captain. His name was William Prince, P-R-I-N-C-E. He was in the river boating business here on the Ohio River long before the time of dams. So they'd run into problems of low water, which they couldn't move. Where's an old time engineer go after he's cooled or down? People this day and age think, well, the river was always like this. No, the river wasn't always like this. The river was dry in the summertime in dry spells. No, we used to walk across the High River and up until 1927 when Block 27 went in, right above Huntington. Summertime, it could dry. You know, they talk about the good old days, how the river used to freeze. Sure, the river used to freeze. Wasn't bigger than a good sized creek. It was very difficult to get across the Ohio River, not in the summer, because it was so shallow you could even ride a wagon across. There's a an illustration of cows in the middle of the river, and the water is only halfway up their legs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could skate on it years ago, yeah. Yeah, they even, the cars would go across it years ago. You could go get cars across it. That's way back, you know. See, the river wasn't as high then, and it wasn't as deep. It's just been dredged and everything, too. Oh, it would freeze solid, and the boats couldn't go up and down. No, it's, oh, yes, not only that, I remember many people telling me about walking across the river in the wintertime, uh, some of the kids in high school. They, they got to school earlier because they could come across the river and didn't have to go up and come across the suspension bridge. It's, of course, today a more controlled river. And each pool between the dams is, is, is a uh, stationary nine feet. And I remember one newspaper article I read, and I believe it was 100 years ago, 1895, where the river was two feet. You could walk it. Of course, you couldn't put any boats in it then, and you can imagine what that did to river traffic. Or in the winter, 
when it would be so low it would freeze solid and you could walk across it. I'm sure for the children that was wonderful. If you had an old sleigh, take the horses out if you could skate on it. But again, to lose the channel, to lose the river that could carry the traffic, uh, you could not depend on the river in those days. And so you shut down in the winter months. You shut down sometimes when it was so low. The barges that you see out on the river hauling the coal, the government dredges that out. They dredged them out and everything, the locks, all that kind of stuff was done with, you know, taxpayers' money. The rivers changed, too. They used to have these little flood control dams every so often, but these dams now they have a far cry. There used to be 200 dams. They've been replaced by 50. When I first started Lock 12 in July 1930, we had 160,000 ton a month. That was a big month. Now you're running 2 million. So there's a big change in the high river. Grafton, West Virginia was your first flood control dam, built in 1936. And it took years to get your flood control dams because you fought everybody. Nobody wanted to move. You covered hundreds of thousands of acres of valleys for this, which mean that the government had to relocate so many people. One of the things about a river is it does what it wants. And so through the years, there have been mighty floods on the Ohio, and we, we live here by the suffrage of the river. Didn't it pay children? But oh, my Lord, didn't it? Didn't it? Didn't it? Oh, my Lord, didn't it rain? Oh, didn't it rain, children? My great-grandmother died as a result of the 1884 flood. The family came back from Ireland in 1884. Uh, A lot of the Irish settled in South Wheeling in a little neighborhood down there. And right off, they were hit with a very large flood, the 1884 flood. And I think the working class, a lot of them settled in South Wheeling, which of course was in the floodplain, and so they were prone to get the water. Well, I do remember the 36 flood. At that time, I was working for Valley Camp Coal, and I do remember rowing up Market Street in a skiff. It had to be about 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we rode up Market Street, and to miss a traffic light, we had to duck our heads. The water was that high, and uh, we decided it was too much of a current. When the river crested at 57 point something feet, I was at the end of the suspension bridge on the island side with cap lamps, and uh, I couldn't get any farther. The only thing that was sticking up was chimneys and a few roofs of three or four-story homes over there and church steeples. And uh, there were women trapped on the attic of one of these four-story homes, and they had the window open screaming for me to come over and get them. Well, I couldn't go over and get them. The current was too swift, and then they were too far away. When I think back to the 36 flood, my thoughts go to the people, how they reacted to each other. You could live next door to someone and never know their name for years, and then after that flood, you knew everybody, and everyone knew you, because everyone was helping everyone. When I first moved to the island, I said, well, we ain't going to have no more floods, and it started. When I moved on a back river, I wanted to be a nice neighbor to my friend, and his tanks broke loose on his trailer, see? 
So they come down, and I thought, boy, I'm going to save him. So I had a boat. I always had a boat, you know, an old John boat. So I went out and pulled the tanks in, tied them to my back porch. And I told him, Red, I says, I got your, you don't need to worry about it. The next morning, I look up, my boat was still there. But the porch went down the street with his tanks on it and knocked my neighbor's fence down. My brother and I sat through the afternoon and looked out the front windows, looking right down into the river and watched it get higher and higher and watched uh, objects come down, chicken coops, houses, livestock. Ed, not only Hooley, but uh, Bridgeport, Martin's Ferry, and Benwood, and uh, Shadyside. The whole area was just completely covered with water. It's just hard to believe that that much water could exist. I love excitement. <laughs> Every flood I've loved, well, you know what they usually do in a flood. You always get in a supply of whiskey. And then if the houses are close enough, you put a board from your porch over to the house next door. And in that way, you can mingle, you know. And if it has to go clear down the street, you do that. And uh, so you're not completely alone in your house. And then, of course, someone always has to get over the chills, and we have to have a little bit of whiskey and water or something like that. <laughs> and you have to have the deck of cards ready. You have to just wow away the time. Part of my family comes from Benwood, and they got flooded nearly every year. And it was just, you know, you knew where to put the pianos. You you had it down to a science of the heaters and the cooking and everything and, and uh, had it pretty well judged. And unless it was an unusually horrible flood like the 36, you pretty well had it psyched out. So you were flood professionals. You have people over in that Wheeling Island that get flooded all the time. And you, you think, why do they stay there? Why do they live there? But see, that's, that's their home. And so they just do... But since the new dams they put in and the new lakes throughout the state of West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio, it's helped tremendously in checking the water and keeping it in bounds. And they tell you, you know, that there, there'll never be another flood like the 36 flood since they put the dams in. But we've had some pretty good floods, so I guess the dams can't control that altogether. When it rained five days in the sky, sun dark as night. When it rained five days in the sky, sun dark as night. Then trouble taking place in the lowlands at night. And I've had adventures on the island where I've almost lost my life in the river. I was almost pulled under a large barge. We had the boat club between the bridges on Wheeling Island. And uh, as I tried to take the boat into shore, I forgot about it was June and that the current is very swift in June and that a large boat has a current by it. It pulls the water under it. So if you ever dive from a large boat, you dive away from it so you won't be caught in that current that's under the boat. So I forgot about that. 
and I uh, took my boat too close, and the, it just snapped it like that, took it right under, and took my shoes off my feet. You know, I had enough presence of mind to hang on, stand up and hang on, and pull my legs up. And then we had to scream, and the rivermen came and saved us, but we were hanging there. I had two girlfriends with me. Once a year, during the summer, it'd be one black boy would get drowned in the Ohio River. Because they couldn't go. They loved to swim, but nowhere to go. Once a week, we could go to Bel Air, a modern ferry. Wheeling, you couldn't swim. Ogre Bay, you couldn't swim. So the boys would go to the river. And you know, the river, the, what they say, currents, swift. And you could look for a year or two, it's going to be a black young man get drowned in the wheeling or modern ferry. A belly. You know, when you hear that sound and you know somebody. Not the girls so much, because they didn't. And my boys, one time, remember, he went down there and I said, Don't you ever go in that river again. He said, Mom, I love to swim. I had a kid, his name is Kenny Knapp, went to Sunday school with him. He got drowned in the river, riding the rollers behind his boots. Similar to surfing, I guess. I don't know now. I lived here all my life, never been to the river. Scared death of it. My father told me, Don't you ever go in that river? I never did. We got other people, they were in all the time. Most of the kids, when Richie Pool wasn't open and it wasn't their day, went down to 33rd Street and swam in the river. They would dive off the barges, standard sand and gravel, had barges there alongside the riverbank. And these people would dive off the barges and swim in the river. There was also a swimming pool on the south end of the island at the fairgrounds. My mother used to give us 15 cents to go down there. And we'd keep the 15 cents and sneak up to the river. That's where we learned to swim, up the river. <laughs> that went on for about three years. My mother finally caught on. <laughs> so from then on, we swam in the river. <laughs> the whistling ways of my younger days too quickly have faded on by And all of their memories linger on Like the light in a fading sky River, take me along in your sunshine Sing me your song every moving And winding and free you roll an old river, you change an old river, let you and me river run down to the sea. I had a girlfriend who lived next door, and we would go down to the river in my boat and go out in the channel and take off our clothes and tie our bathing suit to our ankles and swim in the nude. But we were always afraid because my Uncle Fred was there in that boathouse, you know, at 8th Street. And he, we were afraid he'd get his binoculars out. So we'd swim around, and then we'd go underwater and put our bathing suit back on, get in the boat. And wouldn't that have been terrible if we had lost a suit? Oh, I don't know what we would have done. <laughs> my mother never knew. When she said to us, now go down to the riverbank and play, she never knew that that's what we did. Our parents all had whistles. And they were pretty loud whistles. And um, we each had a code, each one of the kids. And I think mine was three whistles. But when our parents wanted us, they'd get out in the backyard or someplace and blow this whistle. We had a hear clear down to the river. And it was time for us to get dressed and hike home. But all of the big paddle wheels would come down from Pittsburgh down to the Mississippi. And when the, as soon as someone would yell, boat, we'd get in our rowboats and row out there so fast and uh, take the waves. And if you took the waves in a canoe, it was very, very exciting. But we knew which boat had the biggest waves. The William Snyder, oh, the biggest waves. We were out there, you know, getting the waves of those boats. I wish I could do that again. But, you know, that then they brought in the oil-burning boats, and there was no paddle wheel. I mean, it was just a little trickle of water back then. We were also sad when they took the paddle wheels off. It's just part of our life gone, you know. 
But the fishing on the river, some of the things you get out of the river, you can't believe it. I'll never forget down the mouth of the creek, this old black guy. And he showed me how to fish. He says, I'll show you how to fish, Sonny. You're doing it wrong. He said, you take a piece of shrimp. He said, now put it under the rock and don't you come back for two days and pick that rock up. And it's going to smell like it. I, I picked it up and there was like maggots on it. I said, oh, jeez, I was just a kid. He says, now here, put it on there. And we didn't have no fishing poles. We had hand lines. Remember, he had hand lines? Throw it out in there. He says, now you want to tease him and talk to him. And I said, come on, catfish. Come on, catfish. Christ, I was catching catfish all the time, you know. And he'd just laugh. He said, you ain't, you ain't talking to him enough, you know. Then I'd get a hit. And he caught all kind of fish. You know, catfish, Joseph, that's how he got his name. We went up to Coleman's and bought a half a pound of green shrimp. Take a little piece of it, put it on the hook, toss it in the river. And then hope. We never caught anything. The fish always got to eat, but we never caught any. Might get a twig or something. If you're lucky, you got a boot. We get the turtles out of the river, my mother and make turtle soup, you know. You ever heard of turtle soup? Oh, my God. Delicious. There's still turtle in that river. We catch them once in a while down over the bank here. My dad used to go down the back river there and reach back in the holes and pull the turtles out. I never do it, though. But the Ohio River has big fish. It has catfish that are six feet long. And when they put in this new dam up here, a friend of mine, Bill Fredericks, was a skin diver. And he went down at the bottom where they were supposed to be doing some work. And he came back, and he refused to get down anymore unless he had something comparable to a 30-30 rifle. And they said, uh, that's crazy. Bill said, no, there's six-foot fish down there, and I'm six foot tall, and when the fish get bigger than me, I'm not going down without protection. And they laughed and thought this was a big joke. It's another one of the big fish stories, you know. Well, two other divers went down and came back and said, yeah, that's right. They're bigger than any of us. And thicker around, too. So I don't know what they did about protection, but I know Bill quit the job. Of course, the Ohio today has tremendous tonnage in commercial traffic. I understand it's even more than the Great Lakes, the Ohio River. And yet it's also a recreation area. And of course, we have seen the pictures on Belle Isle Beach where uh, we had a sandy beach over on the island and the people would go on the summer days in the high Victorian area and, and swim in the river. I don't think as many might swim in it anymore, but certainly the joy of life that the river gives harkens back to an earlier time. Shall we gather at the river where by angel feet have trod? You've been listening to the voices of William Kletner, Margaret Brennan, Ernest Bentfield, Hazel McKeever, Jean Long, Jane Sivert, Martha Huckel, Don Salakovich, Frank Snyder, Pat Cassidy, David Jabersack, Lucian Beckett, Ron Hobbs, Ann Thomas, Tom Griffith, George Thomas, Jack Waterhouse, Earl Summers, Bud Hess, Ann Norton, Buddy Rybeck, Henry Schrader, Beverly Flutie, John Hunter, John Kirshner, Bill Newland, Frederick Reichenbach, Hollis Hackathorn, Easter Pitts, Richard Millard, Jack Fahey, and Mary Lou Henderson. Gathered at the Ohio River was written by Carrie Noble Klein 
Edited and produced by Michael Noble Klein from Field Recordings of the Spoken History Project. This is a production of the Wheeling National Heritage Area Corporation. Charles Flynn is the executive producer. For Wheeling Heritage, I'm Carrie.